Welcome to study five in the series, Jesus Wants His Church Back. What sort of church does Jesus really want? Well, in study number five, we're going to look at the clergy laity divide or a kingdom of priests. What sort of church does Jesus want? You know, the pressure is rising against the church on many fronts. Intellectuals accuse us of mental incapacity. Humanists accuse us of moral hypocrisy uh, and a narrow-mindedness. We are being condemned as intolerant and a danger to coherent human existence. We're in danger of extinction. How will we respond to these pressures? Will we seek God afresh? discover his blueprint and believe that he is still able to do more than we ask or think? We could ask some serious questions. Were first century apostolic ministries mobilizing an all saints ministry team or building a clerical hierarchy? Now we could note Paul's first warning to the Ephesian church in 60 AD. It's recorded in Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. And Paul said, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves, now this is an external attack, will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Now wolves, we know, are ministries bringing falsehoods um, and bringing about destruction in the faith um, of believers. And in Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15, we see Paul's description. Such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder... For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of unrighteousness. See, there's an external attack. Wolves, deceitful workers, legalistic Jews. And they are attacking the church from outside. The church which is gathered around Christ and which was advancing and preaching the gospel, was now facing the attack of these savage wolves that were coming from outside. The Ephesian church succeeded in rejecting the wolves. And Jesus praised them for this in Revelation 2 and verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. However, the Ephesian church failed the internal attack because they left their first love. And this is revealed in Revelation 2 and verse 4. And Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Paul's second warning, also in the same chapter, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 30, around the year 60 AD, and this second attack came from within the church, from amongst the leaders. Also from among yourselves, so this is an internal attack, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. You see, this internal attack were people from within the church. And where they had been gathering together under Christ, now you have ones rising up, trying to draw attention to themselves, drawing away from Christ, drawing away from the truth. And some examples of that are Hymenius, Alexander, Diotrephes. It's recorded in 1 Timothy 1, 19 to 20, and 3 John uh, chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. In 3 John 1, 9 to 10, written around 96 AD, John said, 
I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us, or other translations say spreading malicious lies about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. You see, the church had left first love. They abandoned the foundations laid by Jesus and the apostles. An era of decline followed as the church departed from truth and many false practices arose. And sadly, we can see that in the history that followed these events, there was a history of bloodshed. Religion was used by uh, evil men. The church enters the dark ages. And we can trace the beginning of this going back to 312 AD when the Roman Emperor Constantine became uh, a Christian or he called himself uh, a Christian. Now in this history of bloodshed, if we go to 388 AD, we have Caesar Theodosius and he forbade religious discussion by non-clergy. A fundamental change was starting to take place within the church where they had been based on biblical principles and the priesthood of all believers were all in the church, uh, were called to be disciples of Christ, to be preachers of the gospel. All of a sudden, with this new um, amalgamation between the church and the Roman Empire, we now find that they were mutually supporting each other to support the suppression um, of the freedom of faith. It was supposed to be the giving of freedom, but now it was being taken away from them. In 435 AD, we have the law of Rome. All who do not submit to the doctrines of the Church of Rome must be executed. The church was becoming tyrannical in its merge, its marriage to the Roman Empire. From 590 to 604 AD, we have Pope Gregory I, and he forbade the reading of the Bible by non-clergy. Well, today we try to encourage people to read the Bible, have a Bible, study the Bible, know the word of God for yourself. But the church in wanting to control religion forbade the reading um, of the Bible. In 1231 AD, Pope Gregory IX established the Inquisition to eliminate evangelical Christians and Jews. And the Inquisition continued into the 1800s. But in 1517 AD, a massive change took place. It was called the Reformation. Now, the Reformation and Martin Luther and the 95 Theses that he nailed to the church door in Wittenberg was the beginning of the restoration of biblical Christianity. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't just one event, but it was happening step by step. And God wants to bring about the full restoration of truth within the church. In 1525, there was a movement called the Anabaptists. They believed that baptism was only for those who have repented and believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Now, they still practice baptism by sprinkling but they faced massive persecution. Uh, the Lutherans, the Calvinists, uh, they sent in uh, the military to uh, execute, to kill, to destroy this Anabaptist movement, claiming that they were denying salvation to children because they were not baptizing the children. But then we find later on, there was a man by the name of uh, John Smythe. In 1609, he was a Dutch Baptist. And he introduced the concept, it was a restoration of biblical truth, of baptism by immersion. He also introduced infant dedication, recognizing how the Anabaptists had been slaughtered because of uh, this uh, new revelation that baptism was only for believers. Apart from introducing immersion into the baptismal process, he also made a way for the children to be accepted by having them dedicated. He took a few examples from the scriptures, even though 
this was not the normal practice of the early church. However, under uh, John Smythe and the Baptist, this was introduced to answer the criticism that the children were being neglected. In 1738, we have another step in restoration. And this was the holiness movement led by the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield, the English holiness preachers, Charles Wesley, John Wesley, George Whitfield. These were mighty men of God preaching holiness and righteousness, no longer the hypocrisy and the religious standards that existed in the, the Byzantine Roman uh, Empire and the, the Catholic Church at the time. They wanted a restoration of biblical truth and righteousness within the church. And what came out of that movement was another movement, and it was the movement of modern missions. And from 1788 through to 1834, we have the history of modern missions beginning with William Carey, Hudson Taylor. Now, Carey, he was in India from 1793 to 1834, and he's known as the father of modern missions. Hudson Taylor, from 1832 to 1904, preached the gospel and founded the China Inland Mission. In the same period of time, in countries like Indonesia, we have evangelical missions from 1810 through to 1942. We have them coming in and bringing the gospel to the Bataks um, of Sumatra, uh, the uh, Manadanese in North Sulawesi, to the Poso uh, people of Central Sulawesi, to the Tarajan tribes um, in uh, South Sulawesi, and many other parts of Indonesia, as this evangelical movement uh, was being restored within the church, a, a, a restoration of the preaching of the Great Commission. In 1804, we could have what we could call the first of the Great Restoration Movements. And this was led by Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, now, these men ended up starting the Churches of Christ, but that wasn't their intention. What they wanted to do was to mobilize the church into unity so that in every city, uh, every community, the church was not united. The believers had a commitment and a compassion to preach the gospel and to see the restoration um, of truth. They desired the restoration of simple New Testament Christianity, love, faith, elderships, priesthood of all believers, unity in uh, one body of uh, Christ. Following that movement, there was what is known as the, the Great Pentecostal Revival. Some trace this back to Azusa Street in 1905, 1906, but actually it began a few years uh, before that. On the 31st of December, 1900, we have the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Topeka, Kansas, in the USA. A Bible school student by the name of Agnes Osman, she was attending the Bible school and they'd been praying and fasting that as they were entering into a new century, into the 20th century, that they would experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as it had been in the, in the book of Acts. They had prayed and fasted, and still nothing was happening. But on that evening, Agnes Osman came to uh, her pastor, Charles Parham, uh, who was also leading that Bible school. And she said, I read in the Bible where it says that they laid hands on the people and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Would you lay hands on me that I might be filled with the Holy Spirit? He did. And a great restoration took place. In 1948, following the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the Pentecostal revival, came the latter rain revival. This was in North Battleford, uh, Canada. And at the Sharon Bible College, they experienced this mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. It was led by George Horton, and they had this whole new concept or revelation and experience um, of singing in the spirit. Uh, it was singing the new song being as a congregation being led by the Holy Spirit and worshiping and singing psalms um, unto God being led by the Holy Spirit. They also believed in the perfection of the church that God would raise up a perfect glorious church in the last days that would bring a mighty revival. 
they began practicing the laying on of hands for the healing of the sick, for dedication, for the impartation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for ordination. And they began to teach a principle of multiple leadership rather than one man leadership. They also emphasized the need of the restoration of all five ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. In the 1960s, we have the charismatic renewal. This was a new movement, and some of the forerunners or some of the most prominent and well-known uh, leaders were ones like Dennis Bennett, Derek Prince, and they really emphasized the restoration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, one body of Christ, a global outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all churches, on all denominations. And then followed out of that movement, the 1970s and 1980s, in these restoration movements, we have the 1040 window movement, also known as the AD 2000 movement. And they began to preach that there's a window uh, in the world of unreached people, where 90% of the unreached people of the world uh, live, and we needed to focus um, on this region. Then during the 1970s and 80s restoration movement, this AD 2000 movement from 1980 through to 2000, we also have the restoration of apostolic and prophetic ministries, not just pastors, teachers and evangelists, but apostles and prophets need to be restored to the church. We found that churches began to see that if we're going to have a royal priesthood, a priesthood of all believers, there needed to be an expression where all members of the church could become active. And this, of course, was happening um, in small groups, house groups, home groups, prayer cells, cell groups, life groups, all different kinds of names. But the church was not just meeting on Sundays, but in small groups, twos and threes, tens and twenties, where they could get together and share, and every one of them could be involved in the functioning, in the ministry um, of the church. And along with this came a vision of a united body of Christ, so important in the life of the church. In Revelation 2 and verse 5, Jesus gave a challenge to the church. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This was so important because the church needed to return to what it was like in the early church. You see, in the early church, they were filled with the power of God and they were conquering cities and, and nations and the gospel was going out throughout the world. And this is what we needed to see restored into the church. So if Jesus was going to take the candlestick away, what did that mean? The candlestick, as we see in Exodus chapter 25, had six branches and one stem. And in the six branches, there were three bowls, three buds, three flowers. But in the stem, four bowls, four buds, and four flowers. The total was 66. As you can see in this diagram, you've got 12 in the central column, and then you've got three sets of nine on either, either side. So nine plus nine plus nine plus 12, well, that's uh, 39. That's the same number of books as the Old Testament. And nine plus nine plus nine on the other side, that's 27. The same number of books in the New Testament, all totaled up together, is 66. The Bible. And as it says in Psalm 119 and verse 105, your word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my path. It was a revelation of God's word. And if they were going to lose that, wow, what a tragedy if the church was to lose the power of the word of God. Well, as we mentioned, this decline stopped in 1517 with Martin Luther. Martin Luther began uh, a restoration. But as we look at this diagram, we can see what happened from the early parts of the church. In, in 30 AD, you know, Christ was crucified, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And then we can see 64 AD, Paul was killed, 65 AD, Peter was killed, around 100 AD, uh, John died. And in that period of time, the church had left eldership, that's the leadership model of the church, the fivefold ministries, 
uh, as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Speaking in tongues began to, to decline. New songs, singing in the spirit, uh, began to be uh, abandoned. The church as a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests, was under threat. And the authority of the Bible was being undermined. And the church in this period of time, from uh, the time of the cross coming down to the time of Martin Luther, the church began to practice a priestly tribe, no longer a kingdom of priests where everyone was a king and a priest unto God, but a priestly tribe. Going back to the old legalistic system of the law, the tribe of Levi, a tribe of priests, today called the pastors or the clergy, a hierarchy, a papal system. Instead of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, we now had the Pope, cardinals, archbishops, bishops and priests. Instead of baptism by immersion for believers, we now had infant baptism by sprinkling. A sacramental system was introduced, seven different sacraments that were necessary for a person's salvation. This was a form of religious control. And then eventually what broke uh, the, the camel's back, you could say, the bit of straw that broke the camel's back were letters of indulgence. And Martin Luther protested. And in all, he protested 95 doctrines that had been introduced into the church. And in 1517, Martin Luther began the Reformation. And the Reformation began a process of restoration, as you can see in this diagram. In 1521, we had the restoration of believers' baptism with the Anabaptists. In the 1700s, we had the, the holiness movements. In the 1800s, we had the New Testament church and Matthew 28, the Great Commission being restored and the mission movements uh, beginning to come to the fore. In 1900, the restoration of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 1948, uh, the restoration um, of many truths in the latter rain revival. The 1960s with a charismatic renewal, with the gifts of the Spirit and an emphasis on the unity um, of the body of Christ. In the 1980s, the apostolic and prophetic movements. And today in, uh, well, it's 2021, uh, we have the restoration continues. So from 2020, 2021, going on to 2030, we believe that there's going to be a great restoration of mighty truths in the, um, that have been forecast and prophesied in the Bible. In Acts 3.21, Peter said that Jesus must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. In Joel 2.25, after a time of devastation in Israel, the Lord prophesied, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And we believe that that process is also happening today. God is restoring what has been lost. The royal priesthood is being restored. And it's a movement. It's an all saints movement where every believer is active. Every believer uh, needs to find their place, talents, gifts, and special function. Every person is important. All are important. In Proverbs 6, 6 to 8, we can see how a, a body, now this is just ants, but it's mentioned as an example in the Bible. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. Every ant was important. And so in the body of Christ, everyone has an important role or function to fulfill. No spectators in the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, it says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Everyone has a gift, a talent, a calling. None of us are called to be uh, observers or spectators. We're all called to be active um, participants. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9, Peter said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, we are called to be a priesthood of all believers. Israel was given the opportunity to be a priesthood of all believers, a kingdom of priests. 
They had this opportunity and they missed this opportunity. They missed the opportunity to be what God wanted them to be. They were offered the opportunity to become a kingdom of priests where every person would be a priest and a king. This was the divine answer to the pastoral problem faced by Moses of having to counsel three million people for all could counsel one on one. You see, this was a big problem because Moses was the only person who had met with God. So everybody wanted to come to Moses to get the solution to their problem. But the problem was Jethro came along and he offered an advice that was not according to God's will, plan or purpose. You see, Jethro was a Midianite, idol-worshipping priest. And after they accepted his advice, Israel reaped that seed, becoming idol worshippers and losing the amazing opportunity to become a royal priesthood and in its place, a tribe of priests. Now, this tragedy happened um, in Exodus chapter 19 through to Exodus chapter 32. And in Exodus 19 by verses 5 and 6, here, here is what God offered. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Not a tribe of priests, a kingdom of priests. That's what God was, was offering. Now, Moses had experienced the call and anointing to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. Now, it was God's purpose that all the nation of Israel should also experience this prophetic, kingly, and priestly anointing and to be a royal priesthood. You see, one Moses was able to deliver three million people because he had that anointing. And now God wanted the three million people to have that same anointing. But what happened? Why was this such a disaster? Why did Israel become a nation of idol worshippers? Well, as we mentioned, the whole thing about Jethro, that was a, a terrible problem. Every chapter from Exodus chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 40, we read God said to Moses, except Exodus 18, where Jethro said to Moses, what was Moses' fatal mistake? See, Jethro was a false prophet from Midian. And he gave Moses five prophetic words that were false. Now, the Bible tells us that a prophet who tells lies should be stoned to death. Well, we read these in Exodus 18, 19 to 23. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel. And one, see, here's the, the first of these prophecies. God will be with you. Two, it will be easier for you. Three, for they will bear the burden with you. If, if you do this thing and God so commands you, what, what an amazing uh, boldness uh, he had to say this. Uh, this wasn't God's word. It wasn't God's will. Four, then you will be able to endure. And five, all these people will also go to their place in peace. All of these prophecies fail to come to pass. Jethro was a false prophet and he was leading the people into idolatry. He himself was an idol-worshipping Midian priest. His prophecies were lies. And in Numbers 11, 10 to 15, we can see what happened. Moses heard, now here's the, the fifth of these prophecies, the people weeping throughout their families. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, now here's the first prophecy and didn't come to pass. Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight? The second prophecy, you have laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them? And that you should say uh, to me, where am I to get meat to, to give to all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. The third prophecy that failed to come to pass. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. And the fourth prophecy, if you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. 
if I have found favor in your sight, do not let me see my wretchedness. You see, the Jethro prophecies, every one of them failed. But today, too many people follow blindly and they try to put Jethro's prophecies into place. What a tragedy that Israel faced. I pray that we will avoid the tragedy within the church. You see, the choice was clear. Were they going to be a pyramid like Jethro had outlined to Moses, where he would be up the top and have captains over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens? Was it going to be some sort of a hierarchy where leaders uh, gathered and submitted to Christ's lordship <laughs> like a wheel what was it going to be a pyramid or a wheel with christ as the hub and 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 uh, uh, and having elders you could say as the spokesman coming to the coming to the wheel and and everybody centered uh, together into christ or a pyramid well israel followed the pyramidal model and this led israel to become an idol worshiping people because Israel worshipped an idol, God wanted to destroy them all. Instead of becoming a kingdom of priests, they were given a tribe of priests, the Levites. An awesome opportunity to impact the world was lost. In Exodus 19, 11 to 13, it says, On the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai, and you shall set borders. Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mountain or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Now, they were, initially they were not allowed to come near the mountain, but notice what it says next. When the trumpet sounds a loud blast, they shall come up the mountain. You see, God wanted the people at the appropriate time when the trumpet was, 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 was blown to come up the mountain. God wanted to anoint them with the same anointing he had given to Moses as a prophet, a priest, and a king. And he wanted the nation of Israel to have this anointing as a prophetic nation, as, ki as a kingdom um, of priests. In Exodus 19, 16, we see what happened. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, and everyone in the camp trembled. You see, for Moses, a burning bush was enough. But for a nation of three million people, a burning bush wasn't going to cut it. It was a burning mountain with lightning and thunders, and the people were terrified. Exodus 20, 18 to 19. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet, they saw the mountain in smoke. They trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. You see, they were supposed to go up the mountain, but no, no. They saw this amazing uh, demonstration of the power of God. They trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Moses, you speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses goes up the mountain and God sees the children of Israel worshipping the golden calf. What Jethro had sown had now been reaped. Israel had become an idol-worshipping nation. And so the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord and he said, Lord, remember your covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Moses as a priest interceded on their behalf. Israel had become a broken down bus. Instead of operating on 12 cylinders, they were now down to one. And instead of the bus taking them to the promised land, they're now trying to push the bus. And in Exodus 32, verses 28 to 29, it says, So the sons of Levi did according to the word of the Lord. Now, this is the first day of 
Pentecost. The first Pentecost in the Bible. And it was on Mount Sinai, three months after the Passover. Just like in the New Testament, Pentecost, 50 days, three months after the, uh, the um, on the third month after uh, Passover. But in the Old Testament, about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said to the Levites, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Now, when we compare Acts 2.41 um, on the day of Pentecost, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Under law, 3,000 were slain. Under grace, 3,000 were saved. Which one would you prefer? Law or grace? In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, the call came out. You are a chosen generation. You see, the same opportunity that was given to Israel all those years ago was now being given to the church. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. What sort of a system does God want? What does Jesus want in his church? Does he want a pyramidal hierarchy where only a select few are able to minister to the Lord and everybody else just accepts what is being said? They are called the laity, the uneducated, the followers. Or does God want us to be an active hive? like ants or bees, where everyone is active, everyone has a part, everyone has a gift. And God is calling the church today to be a kingdom of priests. And as we continue in this series, we're going to dig into this a bit more because Jesus said, I want my church back. Jesus said, I will build my church. In, you know, in Revelation 1 to 3, we certainly made a mess of the church. But in 4 and 5, he's given to us the pattern of the church that he wants, a Christ-centered church, a great commission church, a worshiping church, a kingdom of priests church, a church that will fully understand the mysteries of the end times. Let's study this subject more. Let's pray about this and say, Jesus, what sort of church do you want in this 21st century to be able to make the impact of reaching the nations that's upon your heart. Father, I pray that you would let your Holy Spirit open our hearts and minds that we might receive what it is that's on your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.